So first kill, I had to bust out the, the Alice Cullen shirt for this occasion because Team Alice for life, baby, except when I'm like feeling a little bit like enemy, enemies to lovers with like Rosalie every now and again. Also, I'm sure I'm like very red. I was going for an effect and the camera's just not, it's not agreeing with me today. So I've never been tracked down more on social media to cover something than I have for this show, except maybe when you all really wanted me to know that the sequel to 365 Days was coming out. But yeah, I totally get why the sapphic vampire show had so many of you rushing to track me down on all of the social medias I have, which you can follow me at if you don't already listed down below. And I appreciate every single one of you because obviously this was my jam. Is the show perfect? No. Did I have a great time? Yes, but I've been completely obsessed with this as a teenager because it is literally everything I wanted. Yes. First Kill is the story of two girls, Juliet Fairmont and Calliope Byrne, star-crossed lovers drawn together in the way teenagers always are, mutual attraction. But there's just one problem, because there always has to be some kind of problem. Juliet is a vampire and Cal is from a family of hunters. And both of them need to get their first kills. Has there ever been a series more perfect for me? No. Hey Netflix, you, you making, you making season two? You need, you need some extra actors? Do you need someone to be a vampire? I don't even care if you kill me off in one episode, just like, I'll do anything. Apparently season two depends on how many people watch it in like the first two weeks that it's out. So like, please watch this before Friday, if you haven't already, start to finish. Chop chop. Also, let's just like hashtag cast demand in Netflix. Like let's, that's not gonna go anywhere. Also, they went back about a decade to pick up the Stephanie Maybe song, If I Were a Zombie for the intro, which is really fun because the acoustic version of the song specifically starts with her clarifying that there's just like too much vampire stuff. So she wanted to write something about zombies, but you know what? I'll allow it, it vibes. Created by Victoria Schwab, AKA V.E. Schwab, based on a short story from an anthology titled Vampires Never Get Old. You may know her from such books as The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, Vicious, Vengeful, and the Shades of Magic series. First Kill is just everything it needed to be. If you've read the short story, the first episode of the show is essentially that with some like adjustments to make it work as an entire series, but the ending is quite different, which I will touch on in a bit. Yes, it's campy as fuck. The these special effects leave a lot to be desired, especially with certain creatures, but this nails the awkward high school crush and first love dynamics to a T. They fall way too fast and they say a bunch of awkward shit. It's perfect. <laughs> Obviously I have addressed some issues with that kind of like writing in the past, but this just feels a little bit more like authentic to the teenage experience. Like I saw two teenagers viciously making out before men by Alex Garland at the movie theater. And like, I'm like, yeah, they probably talk to each other in the same cringe way that we're gonna get in this show. And unlike Twilight, there isn't some kind of like century plus age gap and like weird power dynamic there. Juliet was born a vampire and aged completely normal into being a teenager. And she's awkward as fuck. One of the reasons why she seems to like Cal so much is that she's just so confident in herself and Juliet's never felt comfortable with who she is. And honestly, I would have died for this series as like a preteen, like teenager. I saw Underworld and Queen of the Damned when I was like 13 and was like, hell yeah, I wanna be like, a fucking romantic like brutal vampire and then like Twilight came out and just like really drove that home. Sorry, this video isn't supposed to be about my weird I want to be special childhood fantasies that included such relics as Jedi, X-Men member, and Digidestined. We're here to talk about camp. Story-wise, I don't think it's doing anything like particularly super unique. You know, it's got a lot of the Ro Romeo and Juliet vibes. You got like the star-crossed lovers from like opposing families. We've seen it before, but it's cute and I like it. Mainly because it is cute cute and gay, and they actually let some diversity into the gay relationship when they're usually quite white, especially if the couple's supposed to be the main folks of the show. So I know that meant to a lot of people. It's meant so much because it is really impactful to see yourself reflected in characters on screen, especially when it's outside of like a token character or teachable moment. They just get to be themselves. I also feel like it does a pretty good job ditching some tropes. Spoiler alert, neither one of these characters dies tragically. So we are just dodging that barrier gaze trope. I didn't even watch the 100 and I'll never Never forgive them for Klexa. I mean, in terms of it just being like a supernatural related show, I think it does like a pretty decent job with things. It stays focused on our central characters, but it builds out lore and conflicts for future seasons, giving time to both Julia and 
Cow's family. So what we end up with is a cute little supernatural coming of age story where the inhuman character might actually end up being more relatable to you than the human one, depending on what kind of things you went through growing up as a kid. I think everyone goes through periods where they feel like an outsider, wishing they were normal. But the one thing this show doesn't do, which I am so glad of, is make being gay something they wish they could change about themselves. I think that's a really important area of media to explore, just showing people comfortable in that aspect of themselves while dealing through other teenage struggles. Plus the supernatural shit, you know. Just regular teenage stuff. I do think that the show starts off a lot stronger in certain areas. I, I think it gets a little bit messy with picking up and dropping conflicts. It's clearly just trying to drive forward their relationship, but there also isn't a lot of breathing room for it because they're setting up so many different threads for future potential seasons, but I do wish there was some more time just for them. I'll be honest though, I give a lot of the weaker aspects of the show a pass because I just want this relationship to progress. Because <laughs> up until now, I've largely had to turn to the world of literary fiction fiction to satisfy this demographic, which honestly isn't a problem at all. Stories are amazing, so you should definitely check out today's sponsor, Audible. You know the drill, but I'm still gonna say it. If you're looking for audiobooks or spoken word entertainment, Audible is the best choice for you. They offer thousands of titles from classics to new releases, memoirs, podcasts, and the book talk infamous, so you'll always be able to find the perfect piece of entertainment for you. Every month you get a credit you get to use on any title, including new releases that you get to keep for life. Your membership also gives you access to the Audible Plus catalog, which gives members unlimited access to select audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, sleep tracks, and more at no additional cost. With summer in full swing, there is no better feeling than enjoying some fine weather with a good audiobook. After finishing First Kill, I ended up stumbling upon another gay high school vampire story called Coldest Touch, so I'm definitely going to be working my way through that this weekend. Audible is also probably the only gift I'm ever going to have to give my mother again. You're welcome, mom. So if you're someone looking for new ways to be inspired, you just want to make it through more stories or be entertained in day-to-day -day life, make sure to head on over to audible.com slash Jedi or text Jedi to 500-500 to get 30 days completely free. So at first I thought this show was exclusively going to be following Juliet, but it's actually split right down the middle. We're just starting with Juliet's life and for all of her struggles, the main focus she seems to have is her crush, as is always the case. You could be dying in high school, a family tragedy could have occurred, and your main focus is still gonna be getting some smooches from the person you have a crush on in English class. And then the second half focuses on Cal's life and how she always has to move, she's never making any connections, trying to prove herself to her family, even though they love and accept her for exactly who she is. So starting off with Julia, we just get right into the steamy in her dreamy. Red pills are falling around her, she's making out with Cal, who she's not currently with or ever really spoken to, but it quickly flips to her feeding. So her dreams have been getting progressively more and more intense because she's been putting off her first kill and trying to satiate off of these blood pills. The vampires don't need to kill to feed, but apparently when you hit a certain stage, you do have to make at least one kill to complete your change. And until she does, she's gonna be dealing with horrible headaches, nightmares, throat on fire, all of her senses going into overdrive, and eventually even blood tears. Eventually building to a point where she would probably just kill someone accidentally, super violently. God, growing up is so tough. But as much as she's struggling and as overwhelming as everything is getting day to day, something about Cal helps drown it all out. So not at all like Edward and Bella. And Juliet's older sister, Eleanor, is essentially the exact opposite. She's super confident in herself, has the ability to mind control people, and she's downright stoked on her darker nature. Totally fine threatening to kill Jules' best friend, Ben, who is also gay, but also a star athlete and super popular at school. So as long as Juliet is hanging out with him, she feels somewhat normal. I love that it's not really the fact that she's a vampire that makes her feel completely like an outcast. It's just her like genuine teenage awkwardness. Like telling Ben she's definitely talked to Cal when it's really just a series of awkward glances and failed attempts. So he's Aren't you Cal. in my- <laughs> Oh my god, it's too real. The show also manages to slam in a ton of songs and it never really feels awkward like it did in the most recent 365 Days movie, which was just like a series of music video fucktages. This had some banger karaoke moments with songs like Before He Cheats and I Feel Like a Woman. Last a home and a four time. 
Classics. But then we get the primo. It's just so awkwardly adorable that you feel like you need to look away, but you don't look away because it's just so adorable. When Juliet bumps into Cal and just starts like stumbling over herself, complimenting her name and like trying to invite her to a party. I saw a lot of people making fun of this on Twitter, but like teenagers are awkward and this show is campy. We've dealt with way worse for a smidgen of gay. Cal does seem kind of guarded, but after Juliet delicately saves a bee off her shoulder, she agrees to the party. Except I feel like Cal's gonna find one of the blood pills she dropped, which is what leads to this very obvious setup. Class ends and Juliet notices Cal's bracelet on the floor in front of her locker, but it's pure silver and burns her hand. Obviously this was a test and your new potential hot GF wants to murder you. Not that she suspects that yet, but I think that Cal might be more into Juliet than she wants to let on. They get to the party, Ben orchestrates some spin the bottle magic, and even though Cal looks extremely standoffish and unimpressed, Juliet just puts the move on in that pantry. Hi. <laughs> Hi, she says, and then she just asks if you can do it again. Get it, girl. And by it, I mean consent. So they start making out, and the whole time, Cal is like holding something that's tucked into the back of her shorts until she lets it go and genuinely gets into the makeout sesh. Uh, my notes auto-corrected that to takeout sesh, which I guess kind of works because Julia gets so into it that she goes for a little nibble. And just like that, we are back to the start of the day from Cal's POV. Then we gotta ask, uh, why did this pantry have like 20 bottles of cherries in it? Anyways, I think that things do move a little bit fast between them, but I get why the show is set up that way. So you have that first episode parallel of their first kills. But I think it would have been nice to have a bit more buildup, some more longing, maybe an actual date between the two before they're just like mashing lips at a party. So then the level of conflict that Cal ends up feeling would make a little bit more sense. Because as mentioned, Cal comes from a huge family of hunters. They are constantly moving around. They're part of a major guild and Cal is specifically trying to get her first kill under her belt and feels like she's behind compared to her brothers. So they've recently moved to Savannah, Georgia, which used to be a major hotbed for monster activity before they were all killed off, but something's causing it to start up again. And no, it's not the vampire family. They've been existing in plain sight for years. Juliet's dad is literally the district attorney. It seems like someone has specifically been summoning and creating monsters in this area. And as gross as they are, Cal acknowledges and has been raised to believe that the worst monsters are the ones that look like humans. Look, the only thing you have to be worried about losing is your breath when Juliet takes it away. <laughs> I'll stop, I'm a menace. But you get shown this really strong family dynamic where they rely on each other for so much because they can't really make those outside connections. They support each other, they work with each other, but until Cal gets that first kill, she's always gonna feel like she's missing something. So she heads to the party to make it happen. So we are full circle in the makeout. Even with all her training and knowing exactly what Juliet is, she just can't help but get into it. Just like Juliet couldn't help but get into it. So Cal stakes her in the chest. Show's over, barrier gay strikes again. But no, Juliet is what is known as a legacy vampire, one descended from Lilith in the Garden of Eden, so she can't be killed that way. That's gonna be awkward. Shockingly, not even the worst thing that happened at this party. Uh, Smashly here ends up brutally murdered and this woman is just smirking at her body. But now the two are in a bit of a weird situation. Juliet wanders home with blood on her mouth, so her family assumes she got her first kill, so she just goes with it. But then the news of Ashley's death comes through, so that's who they assume she killed, but Ashley died particularly brutally, uh, blunt force trauma, not drained of blood, and then someone took her liver. So they think she's gonna be this like secret sadistic killer like Eleanor's twin Oliver who is banished from the family. Yes, there is a lot of drama in here, which is only gonna get worse because now that she has her first kill, she has to have her consecration ceremony where the extended family of legacies will come to honor her change. So her day's not going so great. She doesn't have any blood pills and the fact that someone actually brutally died has her stressed to shit and her sister definitely knows she didn't do it. So kill someone before grandmother and the entire legacy community arrive for the big show. Honestly, say what you will about the special effects and yeah, it can get rough, but I love the red lights stuff when she's dealing with thirst. And on Cal's end, she says she killed a vampire, except it didn't go up in flames and smoke. So now her family knows there's legacy vampires in town, which brings the full attention of the guild down on them. I'm surprised the mom wasn't a bit more like, are you sure you just didn't kill a schoolgirl? And now she wants to smash her prey. So that's definitely a problem. And they both still need their first kills. It all gets worse at the vigil for Ashley. Juliet actually starts crying blood. So Cal follows her saying she just wants to talk. Like in the closet? That was instinct. I could say the same. 
So they end up fighting on the roof. Juliet clearly doesn't want to hurt her, but when Cal slaps her bloody cheek, it paralyzes her hand. That's a fun little legacy ability, apparently. Man, she can't catch a break. So we're in like full Romeo and Juliet mode now. Cal's mom knows who the legacies are after a school meeting. Sworn enemy families, except Cal is also struggling with the fact that she can't take her eyes off the person she's supposed to kill. And really wants to convince herself that she would have staked Juliet anyways, even if she hadn't bit her. I still would have staked you. What? I can hear your heartbeat. It races when you lie. Oh my god, it's so cute! Give me five seasons of this minimum! So just as Cal is trying to process these emotions, she's having full plans to murk the extended vampire family are in effect. Margot clearly had no reason to believe that Talia was a hunter, so she just casually mentions a large family event coming up. Because again, Julia doesn't let anybody know that someone tried to stab her to death, which is really unfortunate considering Cal's also starting to have some very intimate dreams about Juliet in Eden. A connection was apparently formed from the bite. Now, Vampires going back to Lilith and Eden isn't anything new, but in this story, the legacy families are matriarchies and Juliet's family specifically are the keepers of the snake that turned Lilith into the first vampire, the Emerald Malkia. So the ceremony is allowing the snake to bite her to like complete her transformation, but I thought the snake in Eden was supposed to be like Satan, but whatever. Uh, Malkia also apparently means queen of God, so I'm sure there's something there. From here, we obviously get a lot more internal struggles. Juliet doesn't want anything to do with her legacy. She doesn't want to kill. She thinks it's wrong. But her family has a lot to live up to with this ceremony. Then for Cal, she starts wondering if them as hunters are the monsters in the stories of the things they hunt because she's obviously seen the humanity in Juliet and maybe read I Am Legend over the weekend or something. But Cal's side is giving very strong Deb's vibe, which is a fantastic movie that I do need to talk about someday. Uh, Cal actually reminds me a lot of Max, who also rocks. But there's that huge comparison of like living to tell the tale against something that like should have killed you except Cal actually went for the kill but then like you're into the person you were supposed to kill but because Cal actually vocalized these thoughts of monster humanity to her friend Tess here she is blocked from the hunt which is kind of good because her mom had her set up to be the one to kill Juliet. This is where they realized that she was likely bit in the altercation and think that the vampire venom is doing some kind of like mental manipulation inside her so the Gil sends this dude to watch her who ends up being an absolute fucking weirdo creep who plans to like set her up for death so she nards him and runs, only to be grabbed as a sacrifice for Juliet. And now I'm starting to think that the sister was always the sociopath. Oliver actually showed up for the ceremony and helps Juliet get Cal free. And because Eleanor has this mind control power, it wouldn't surprise me if she had used it to turn her family against him to conceal her own more brutal tastes. You know her, you like her drain her. Yeah, we are lacking some humanity here. Like, Eleanor flat out doesn't want it, but she knows Juliet does. Like, shouldn't the tactic have been like, hey, I just busted out this child murderer. Help the world by taking him out. Not, here's the girl you want to kiss. Kill her. In the book, she actually does make the decision to have Cal be her first kill, even if she does wish she could be normal and they could just go on a date. Uh, here, she is pure simp supreme. The book ends at the party scene where Juliet doesn't even go down from the stab and they smirk at each other from across the party with the open ending that they're gonna have a back and forth who kills who first. That could have been fun. Like, have them fighting their responsibilities for flirting. This was fine, though. Out of the whole family, Eleanor seems the most dedicated to making Juliet fall in line. Even her mom is more understanding of her not having an interest in the legacy of the legacies because she also shunned her duty by marrying and turning a human. But now the hunters show up and start laying out vampires left and right, except they aren't dying even with their fancy silver spears. Guild fucked up so bad that Tess's parents here are killed by Oliver. So she's obviously gonna be a major conflict for Cal and Juliet's relationship, right? <laughs> Except she gets like immediately taken away by the guild before she can add to the drama at all. It's like uh, like a back pocket conflict for a later season. But the Burns manage to kidnap Oliver and realize that he has some kind of like witchcraft going on with him. So I'm guessing the girl at the party is his witch girlfriend. But guild creep catches up with Cal and Juliet can somehow hear her screaming even though her mouth is covered, saves her, uh, then Cal knocks him out. But they think he's dead. You'd think a vampire would know pretty fast if someone was alive or dead, but like she calls Ben to help deal with it instead of her family who would obviously have experience with like disposing of bodies. But obviously this guy was not dead and because he then tries to kill them again, 
Juliet drains him. So I'm waiting for some kind of like emotional reaction that she finally had to do the one thing she's never wanted to, but it doesn't come. Ben is obviously freaking out because he had no idea and I assumed it was gonna change Cal's perspective, but she's just like, well, she saved me. <laughs> Except now they actually have a body to conceal instead of calling her family, uh, who admittedly might have a bit of problem helping her right now because her dad isn't fully healing because he's not a born vampire and the sister is making marriage bargains to convince Grant any bitch to save him. But you think your very human teenage friend is a better source than your vampire family? That's just a bad call. We don't bury bodies. We're smarter than that. Of course they get stumbled upon by friends and it's not just any friends, it's Ben's secret boy toy Noah who's dating this girl. Ouch. For everyone. Except Noah. You don't have to come out, but you don't have to be a dick either. So they have to pretend that they were there remembering Ashley because it was one of her favorite places to drink and again burying the body in a place where teenagers are known to party. Just bad choices at every turn. Juliet and Cal walk off to talk about what just happened. Cal wants to know what it felt like and I guess she somehow knows that Juliet's never killed before. Uh, still no crisis though. She just says she feels different and that it felt right. Not necessarily what you want to hear from your pretend potential vampire girlfriend who you're trying to see the humanity in, but she actually just ends up seeing this as like how far Juliet's willing to go for the people she cares about. The absolute most romantic, rose-tinted look at this situation from someone raised to murder vampires, but I'll allow it. Then they come across the peach tree from the Eden dream and realize how much they're connected, which is finally what throws Cal off, thinking her thoughts are being manipulated from the bite, and Jules is like, hey, I betrayed my entire family because I know my feelings are real. If you don't feel the same, maybe I'm the one who should be questioning. Man, teenagers. Pretty sure this goes uh, a lot further than kissing here though. Uh, no romantic first time for Juliet, just peaches falling from a tree. Nothing gets in the way of passion. Except Juliet's dad showing up, who's now been turned full legacy by the snake, but is acting really weird with glowy green eyes. Probably because the snake actually just crawled inside his body for some reason. Uh, and then he starts driving them both to a meetup spot to trade Cal for Oliver. When presumed witch girl starts up a storm in the road, releases some ribbon that looks like what they pulled out of Oliver, leading Cal and Juliet to run away. And then Oliver vanishes. So there's definitely some witchery at play, but just like that cow's thinking of first love, they're exhilarated, committing crimes, they break into the school. And according to Sarah Catherine Hook, there was a plant shower scene, but the water was way too cold. I don't know if that was supposed to happen here, but that's something y'all lost out on. And if the comparisons weren't obvious enough, the school has to be doing a production of Romeo and Juliet, but this was a really nice chance for them to get to know each other. Favorite food. <laughs> Good one. Obviously, both sets of parents are pissed thinking that they're going against who they are for the other, but Juliet's family has a little bit much to worry about with whatever legacy shedding is going on with the dad here, his insatiable hunger, and the fact that Eleanor agreed to marry into the family that Margot bailed on to make the Atwood legacy right. Things are also screwed up with Ben. He starts being a dick about what she is, how it'll never work with Cal as a human. So obviously that makes her point out that he's just Noah's secret side piece, which makes Ben try to push harder for Noah to commit which just pushes him away. Props to Ben for sticking up for his self-worth though. We love that. As they're arguing, a monstrous blur zooms by them. And this is when I realized that the town was aware of the monster activity, but just thought they were all gone. I just thought that that would have been like some kind of town myth, not something that people just accepted as reality. That seems dumb. Cause literal monster alarms go off to like notify the school of a potential monster on campus. It's amazing. Either way, I assume Noah was gonna die and yep, there he goes getting attacked by a zombie and then that spine just gets yanked out of his body. Holy shit. So I guess there's some barrier gaze here. That's unfortunate. It's like they're pulling a reverse Uno here. It's like, oh, he's not out and he's committed to the closet so can't be the trope, which also usually goes after the lady. So I guess we're still good. So Julia and Cal go to stop it and realize that the zombie is Ashley. Seems like Oliver and his witch are actually making and summoning monsters all around town to cause chaos. And they had actually originally set up Ashley to be Juliet's first kill. So that's fucked up. But back at the Atwood Fairmont house, the negotiations are not going well. It's a matriarchy, but the Davenports essentially want to use Eleanor as their heir incubator and move her up to Toronto. Yes, the rival vampire legacy family is Canadian, where apparently people just line up to be blood donors. Fascinating. So Eleanor backs out because she wants power, not someone using her for power. So grandma's not happy. She is fighting tooth and nail to keep the Malkia and their family. So the dad snaps and eats her. No! 
<laughs> it's so bad. Can't wait for the Am I the Asshole post about that one. You ate my mother. Yeah, Mark goes into it though. No explanation as to why the snake still seems to be inside him. Very confused. But after taking out the zombie and getting her first kill, Cal is bleeding and Juliet is struggling. Only stops when she's reminded of how delicate she was with the bee, how Cal knew she wasn't a real monster in that moment. But it's not until Oliver grabs her that Juliet really snaps out of it. Babe, can't you see? Cause this is a love. But his aim isn't to kill Cal. He wants Juliet to help him get revenge on Eleanor and even says he could make her human in exchange. Feel like that's probably a lie. But now the town is turning on Sebastian as the DA because they think he's trying to cover up a series of monster attacks. And because Cal's family believes she is literally chemically obsessed with Juliet from the bite, they plan to perform a severing to purify her blood and psyche. Imagine it worked. She was just like, shit, I was gonna turn my whole life and family dying dynamic into this right for a vampire. Sucks to genuinely be in love, Juliet, but your venom did some fuckery. Obviously not the case, even after the severing, they still have connected dreams. I guess love uh, finds a way. But it does seem to fuck up Theo. They had him strapped to her to speed up the recovery because he has the antibodies from his severing. Apparently his bio mom was killed by a vampire. And now he's having memories of watching his mother die, realizing that it was daytime and that the bite marks healed, meaning it had to be a legacy, only their saliva heals wounds. So he's going deep into legacy research. But meanwhile, Cal climbs through Juliet's window via trellis to tell her that their relationship has to end, that she has to choose her family now that the connection is severed. Except this is a mutual dream and they are still connected. Now I think that actually has a little bit more to do with Juliet than Juliet's venom, but we'll have to hope for answers next season. I think she might have some kind of psychic thing going on. Her dream from the beginning is the same outfit from the party before it happened. There's a lot of other instances of that but we'll see. Juliet then wakes up to snake boots delivered outside her door and they are apparently not from Eleanor, but she does want to take her out partying so she can show her how fun it is to be a legacy vampire. You never find out who leaves her the boots, but snake skin seems intentional. So they go out drinking and drinking, which is apparently the only way Eleanor can get Juliet to feed. The guy she picks is high on ecstasy, so when Juliet takes a sip, she gets high too. They get carried away and Eleanor accidentally kills him, which sobers Juliet up real fast. Ewan! Oh my God. This is exactly what she doesn't want to be. She's upset with how okay Eleanor is with killing people and how amused she is by gators feasting on his body. We don't have to kill to survive. Then she finds out that she keeps all of their IDs as like serial killer souvenirs in a storage locker. That's stupid as shit. So she goes to Ben's place for support and notices that Oliver left a letter in her purse, which just reiterates that he can turn her into a human if she helps, which seems unnecessary, but at least the friendship is patched. But Ben's mom has started a Mothers Against All Monsters group, AKA Ma'am. She's also a Paltrow smoothie nutter. So yeah, that's gonna be great. Uh, at least Cal's brother Apollo is is help training them. He's also pulled into the Eleanor web. They have like a fun little enemies, but I think you're hot banter. And the new drama on top of everything else is that Cal's family is planning to leave ASAP. The situation has gotten way too intense with the Cal-Juliet dynamic, so they want to force that distance and Juliet obviously uh, pretty set on stopping that from happening. She climbs up into Cal's window and has to be invited in. It's very old school rules. Sadly, a lot of the dialogue here feels a little awkward. Like some of the responses don't seem to line up well, but they basically just say that they feel like they're meant to be. Z young love, it's cute. The Burns tried killing Juliet's entire family, almost actually killed her dad, and she's just like, no care, just simping. Simp, 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 simp. And if there wasn't already enough to deal with, Philippa's dog found Clayton the hunter's body. So now the kids are being interrogated because police know that they'd been drinking in the area and the death has caused the ma'am group to really ramp up. And Cal, for some reason, thinks that her family will help Juliet deal with it because she killed Clayton and save her, and she's suddenly full on the who cares if they think the severance worked, we're together, train, instead of the I have to pick my family, express. They take it about as well as you can imagine. Oh, hell no. But after listening, they won't help Juliet, but they also won't turn her into the police either. So I guess that's something. Juliet's just mostly stoked on the commitment though. But before the Burns family can figure this out and vacate town, the guild shows up with buckets of silver because they suddenly know that Juliet killed Clayton and think they might be hiding her. <laughs> yeah, they unintentionally are, but you know. Obviously Juliet and Cal plan to bail out and actually go to Oliver for help. But after talking to him, it like, like lingers on the devil 
devil tarot card, so like, who knows what promises he plans to keep. Or maybe they're gonna bring the devil into this show. But before they can make it, they get pulled over by a cop doing a routine monster check. And even though it's Juliet that's sketchy about the silver test, the cop thinks that it's Cal and calls the mom group after escorting them to Juliet's. And Margot wants to bop Cal because it's drawing way too much attention to the house, but Cal rightfully points out that like once they clear her, they're probably gonna search her place and find all the plans leading like right back to them and their technical vampire den. So now for the first time, Juliet's the one feeling weird knowing that there were actual murder plans for her and kind of wondering what would happen if the Burns ever did figure out how to kill legacies. Is Pirate safe with you? Okay, that's that's a little cringe. I'm so sorry. It's mostly because like some of the dialogue just doesn't seem like it naturally flows with like what was just said, but guess what? I'll still allow it. Teenagers would say this stuff. And if Cal wasn't causing enough problems for the Burns family, Theo and Apollo decide to leave instead of sitting still like they're supposed to, to try to figure out like what legacy vampire family killed his mom. So Apollo says they should hit up Eleanor and let him take point because they got a little something something. We got a little bad going. Yeah, you do. But Theo can't be patient, walks in on them making out, gets pissed off, it starts a big fight. Then when Apollo tries to stab Eleanor, he accidentally stabs Theo. GG boys fucking crushing it. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't just like ask Juliet. Like she obviously would have been the safer source. Simp, simp, simp. Cause then Eleanor wipes Apollo's memory so he has no idea what happens, just that Theo's dead and it was probably his fault. So now we are into our final episode. Cal's whole life is flipping upside down. Her brother is dead. She's wanted for murder as a monster. Juliet stays behind to clean up so that Cal and Apollo can avoid getting arrested and then realizes Eleanor likely had something to do with it because she finds her lipstick and hears a faint heartbeat. So she's pissed and confronts Elnor who rightfully points out that like they tried to kill her and that Juliet's more upset that Theo ended up dead instead. But this is just really more the final breaking point of Juliet realizing how sadistic her sister really is. But then they make such a huge deal of her like dropping her storage locker key back in her drawer. So Obviously, Juliet uses this to sell Eleanor out to Oliver and she gets arrested for her mass murders. Maybe you don't keep the trophies just sitting on top of the boxes like that. Then Oliver shows up as her lawyer and confirms my suspicions, but worse. It wasn't Eleanor that did things and made everyone believe it, it was Oliver. She just made Oliver do the horrible things like kill his pet turtle and their psychologist. You know, I spent most of my time in exile trying to answer one question, why? I just felt like it. Yikes. However, once Cal and Apollo get home, Theo is already there just eating and chatting up a storm before doubling over in pain and growing fangs. Oh no. So far, the only good news we've received here is that Cal suddenly isn't a person of interest anymore because the guild pulled some strings. So that conflict's just barely an inconvenience. So the Burns have realized that Theo is now a vampire and the dad actually wants to kill him. Instantly thinks he's a monster, but Talia's not having it. He cannot live in this house. Over my dear body. And she's not even his bio mom. She just stepped the fuck up. And if it wasn't already tragic enough, it wasn't Eleanor that changed him. Juliet did accidentally. She heard the faint heartbeat. He begged her for help. She tried to drain his blood so he'd die peacefully, but like, I guess it, didn't work out and I don't know why she just didn't call an ambulance like Apollo probably should have done when the stabbing first happened, but like, oh well, vampire. And that's exactly the line that needed to be crossed for Cal to want nothing to do with her. Like I get it though, this seems like a fair line. She kind of turned him into the one thing he hates more than anything else in the world. Put her parents into a position where they're feuding over what to do, knowing she'll have to watch him die all over again. And also really drives home that she turned him into a monster. So that's gotta hurt when that is exactly the thing you you are. She's just the fancier version. But Juliet is still making the simp love plays, how Cal couldn't just turn her feelings off that fast. You can stick me if it'll make you feel better. You know I won't die. But all that did was make Cal promise to find a way to kill her. Uh, I remember that aspect of teenage love as well. I'm joking. But that blows, why would you destroy my cuteness? Obviously Cal's exceedingly conflicted cause yeah, she does still love her, but it's her family. Thankfully she won't have to watch him die again. Uh, the dad said that the family had to kill them together, but mom busts him out instead. And while I thought she was gonna contact Margot for help, she goes to Oliver of all people, who reveals that he is building a monster army to just 
fuck shit up. So like so much for just wanting revenge on Eleanor. Okay, I know Theo's a vampire now, but he spent his entire life being a monster hunter. So you think he might, you know, like warn some of the people who would, you know, have an issue with that and that he might have an issue with that. But like, guess we'll find out. Seems like a dumb thing for Oliver to show him. Can't end yet though, because we need the iconic violent ends have violent delights line to close out our tragic love here that they both fell too quickly and are suffering the loss. Classic. So that's where we're left off. The central couple is split up. The Atwood Fairmonts are being challenged for keepers of the Malkia. Their public persona is now threatened and no one knows that Sebastian ate the existing keeper. The Burns family is essentially destroyed and Oliver is ready to hit the gas. Also betting the guild's planning something against the Burns too. If we don't get season two, I'm gonna be very upset. Please watch this show and like maybe we'll get like a bigger monster budget next time. But honestly, not as into the extended monster lore. Vampire romance only. That is gonna do it for today's video. Let me know what you guys are thinking in the comment section down below. Did you watch the show? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did you accept it for the campy fun? Are there aspects you love? other aspects you hated. But thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.